Hi, uh, welcome. This is uh, the BFRB Club's December webinar. Uh, since we're approaching holiday seasons, and I was uh, reading, um, I was reading uh, the prompts and your answers to the prompts, and I've realized that this is going to be a very difficult period for quite a few of you. So I decided to make the webinar on self-soothing. Uh, but because I had already prepared something else before changing my mind, you will have a surprise around New Year's, somewhere between Christmas and, and New Year's. So there will be another webinar this year. So stay tuned for, for that one. Um, so <clears throat> today we will talk about self-soothing and body-focused repetitive behaviors. Uh, this is a topic that I think is incredibly important. Uh, and I will try to present self-soothing uh, in a way that that's not, hopefully by the time I'm done, you will have an idea, a set of guidelines uh, on how to find ways to soothe yourself. But what's even more important to me is for you to understand self-soothing as a healthy, normal need that we all have. Uh, so think of that as as being my my secret agenda for for this webinar. Uh, so I will let's just briefly if if slides would kindly change. Okay, here they are. Let's just briefly go over the topics that we will discuss. Uh, we will talk about first. I will we will talk about uh, what my clients say or think at least out loud about self soothing. I will give you a couple of examples uh, because uh, these kinds of examples are precisely what um, what got me to to create this webinar in the way in which I did it. Um, I think it illustrates very nicely how client, people who struggle with BFRBs how they relate to their needs even when they are perfectly normal needs. Um, then we will talk about what self-soothing is and what it isn't. Uh, we'll talk about the function of self-soothing, so what it does for you, what makes it so important. Then we'll talk about babies a little bit. Um, I wrote about some of this in the in the blog post that you can read. Uh, you can read in the in the blog section of the club. I believe it's called. Uh, self-soothing as a as a vital need, uh, but I will expand on that a little more and discuss some aspects that I didn't talk about in that text. We'll talk about words and experience. Uh, this may seem unrelated to self-soothing, but you will see that this is actually where uh, where you will find maybe the most important piece of the puzzle when it comes to how to find different ways to self-soothe. We'll talk about aspects of self-soothing, and I don't think this is the most fortunate way of phrasing it. Uh, think of this as uh, domains or or properties of certain activities that you can that you need to identify to know that they might be soothing for you. So it's different different well aspects facets of self-soothing. And then I will talk a little bit about experimenting and give you some pointers as to where and how to start experimenting with different techniques and what is it that you can um, you can use and 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 how to assess if if they work if they're working well enough for you. So this is uh, overall what we will be talking about. Let's start with a few clinical examples. So here is my client from about two weeks ago, uh, writing about about self soothing. Actually, we were we were talking to put this in 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 a context. Um, we were talking about self soothing as something that that uh, hair pulling provides for my client, and he was able to identify this as true. It kind of clicked with him the idea that pulling uh, soothes him because it gets him to, to just kind of zone out and go into this very strange world where only texture counts and where his focus is absolute and directed 
you know, towards finding rough hairs and then pulling them out. But then my client responds like this and says, isn't that something that babies do, referring to self-soothing? I shouldn't need that much of it. So whenever I hear I should or shouldn't, or I must do this, or this ought to be like this, uh, both as a therapist and as a human being, there's a I kind of feel slightly nauseous uh, because it seems terribly oppressive and, and not very compassionate or even open-minded uh, in a certain sense. Like, how do you decide how much of something that you should need, especially when it's something that you cannot quantify? So this is not, self-soothing is not a, uh, a like a, a recommended daily caloric intake that you can calculate. And even then, that's only an average and doesn't apply to every person. So it's very hard to say how much of something we should or shouldn't need or what we should think, or what we should feel. Uh, whenever you catch yourself talking about your needs in this way, immediately think, why am I judging myself? Or why am I putting myself in such a rigid framework that I am potentially condemning myself to fail? Anyways, back to the client. So he says, I shouldn't need that much of it. Nothing in my life is so upsetting that I need to self-soothe so much. I pull my hair at least once a day, like today, and then watch the example. I went to work, and sure, there was a patient I operated on that experienced some complications, but he survived. It was nothing that I wasn't ready for. It seems silly that I would need so much of it. So he says I shouldn't need so much self-soothing. Then there's the, there's the comment that says nothing in my life is that stressful. And then there's this statement, sure, there was this very complicated operation that I had to perform. And even if you're extremely ready, a complicated operation is still very stressful. But because my client thinks that self-soothing is not something that he needs much of in his life, then of course, operation and, and the tension of whether the client will survive and the, the pressure to perform you know, well in surgery, uh, that just doesn't count as being a valid reason to self-soothe afterwards. So what you, what you see here is not just the condemnation of one's need, but also a, a kind of ignorance. I don't, I don't want to, um, I, I feel like it's a harsh word. I don't want to judge my client, um, but it is in a way ignorance of why you would need to self-soothe to begin with. Being a surgeon is an incredibly stressful job. Uh, to give you a parallel with being a therapist, obviously different, different jobs, but aside from body-focused repetitive behaviors, I work quite a bit with clients who have borderline personality disorder and even psychotic clients. And especially with BPD, so borderline clients, the, the topic of suicide comes up very frequently. It's something that they think about, attempt, and so on. And even when I am 98% certain that my client is not going to attempt suicide, I cannot say that this is not stressful. I think that will be dishonest towards myself, towards you who are listening, and then also to all my clients, because I care about my clients. So I, even if there's a 2% chance that they might try something on impulse, I will be stressed. It might not be overt anxiety. I may not, you know, have difficulties breathing. I may, it, it doesn't mean that I will ruminate on this for seven days until our next session, but it's really dishonest to say that after a session where you talk about death and suicide for 60 minutes, you have, you don't need to self-soothe in any way, right? So self-soothing is not some special need that people that people have when there's something wrong with them. It's just a need that people have because sometimes life is just difficult. There is suffering out there and sometimes we need to alleviate that suffering and that's what self-soothing is for. Here's another example. I'm so completely incapable of tolerating life that I need to do these breathing exercises to make it tolerable. So breathing exercises are a good way to self-soothe. Just a side note, 
So here's my uh, the continuation of my very sarcastic client. That's reassuring. Good to know I'm a functional adult who just so happens to have to hinge her well-being on counting her breath for five minutes at least once or twice a day. Why? Why? Right. So once again here, you can see this, uh, not just it, not just a judgment, but also slightly making fun of herself for needing something that is perfectly natural and perfectly normal. The reason why I'm giving you these examples, and I think it's so clearly illustrated here, um, is that uh, you have we can't really choose the needs that we have, right? What we can do is find the healthiest way possible to take care of those needs. And here, my client considers herself incapable for, of tolerating life just because she needs self-soothing. And I will talk about this in more detail later on, but self-soothing is something that dogs need, that cats do, uh, something that everyone does, right? It's, it, it's not just limited to human beings. It, it's also something that animals do. So in a sense, we can talk about it as a biological function, something that we truly need for survival. And then asking the question why, in this context here, I hope it's clear to you that this is not a genuine inquiry. This is a condemnation. This is a judgment. This is a, a lament, if anything, over being so incapable of tolerating life, as, as my client puts it. In general, I think there is only limited um, use or usefulness um, in asking why when you have a burning need. Like if I if I'm so hungry, for example, that I cannot think of anything else except eating, I think it's much better if I just eat. And then once I'm calm and able to think clearly, I can reflect back and think, you know, did I not eat for too long? Was this emotional eating? Was it something completely different? But in the moment when your need is acute, even genuinely asking why doesn't make much sense. If your house is on fire, you don't ask, why is my house on fire? You don't sit there in flames thinking, why me? Why me? You get out of the house, right? So first you take care of yourself and then you can think about why. It is important to know why very frequently because we want to make our change sustainable uh, we want to understand ourselves. We want to make our needs predictable to ourselves. However, this way of posing the question why um, is really not a genuine way, a genuine attempt to answer that question. Uh, it's about the tone, if anything else, right? And I will come back to the tone again in this, in this webinar because it, it has its importance. Here's another one. Um, I'm pretty diligent about doing my self-soothing exercises and they're helping. How long do your clients use them on average before they do, don't do need them anymore? This is a very frequent uh, misconception, or if anything, maybe a poorly formulated goal. Uh, it, there, is no, there is no situation in life in which you will no longer need self-soothing. You can perhaps experiment with different ways of self-soothing and then replace one way with another way that is more efficient or more appropriate or easier to do, but you will always need that. To me, this is uh, something that is like halfway to acceptance. So this is a client that is doing a very good job. So it's a very compliant, diligent, hardworking client, but you can see a relapse on the horizon here. Because this client's idea of self-soothing is let me just do this until I stop. Until I stop picking in this case. And then once I'm done picking, I will stop doing these exercises. Unfortunately, self-soothing is, um, is not like taking uh, antibiotics where you take them twice a day for seven days and then you're done. The same way that if you eat regularly one week, 
you will have to eat the next week as well. So this is a need that will never go away. The trouble with body-focused repetitive behaviors is that they are dysfunctional ways of, of satisfying this need, taking care of it. But the need itself is, is not questionable. It's always going to be there because it is there for everyone else. It's just that other people uh, either have different lifestyles, so there is less uh, of a need to self-soothe frequently. Maybe they tolerate emotions better than you do, so they don't need to employ these mechanisms as frequently, but everyone has their own ways of self-soothing. You can think maybe um, that you just didn't have time over, you know, un until now, hopefully, to actually develop these skills. And this is the, the last example that I have. Uh, if my picking is self-soothing, then it's self-soothing mixed with self-hatred. It's a mix of soothing and harm, isn't it? I protect myself and calm myself down because, but cause harm. I'm telling myself, here's your soothing weakling and here's your punishment too. When you love yourself, you soothe yourself lovingly. And it resonates, doesn't it? I'm not fond of myself. Let's just put it that way, shall we? Uh, this is this is a client who this is uh, here acceptance is not the issue that we are dealing with. Here we're dealing with something that I don't think applies to every one of you that are listening, but it certainly applies to many people. Um, which is that indeed skin picking or hair pulling is both self soothing. And it is harming. You are harming your scalp or wherever you pull your hair from, and you're harming your skin. You're risking having scars. You're risking uh, infections. In case of hair pulling, you're risking hair loss. Um, there's a lot of shame, as you know, and stigma that come with it. So there's a lot on the line. In a, in a strange way, it's both satisfying a need and really punishing or doing it in a punishing way. So it's it's a it's taking care of yourself, but not in a compassionate way. Uh, in 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 this sense, I think the, this client's observation is is really truly very uh, relevant. Uh, and this is a question that perhaps we cannot answer in this webinar, although I might touch upon it. But it is something for you to ponder. You know why. What does it? What does that tell you about the way you relate to yourself? Uh, if you've chosen to take care of yourself by harming yourself at the same time, it's kind of a double bind. It's almost like you're caressing your left cheek but slapping your right cheek at the same time. If it's not a, if it's not proof of of a very um, troubling sense of self worth, then at least there's quite a bit of ambivalence about it. So before I go here, I just want to summarize um, what I was getting at with these examples. One, uh, self-soothing is a need that all humans have and most animals that we can identify self-soothing behaviors in most animals and not just primates either. I have a dog. Um, I have a picture of my dog on one of the other slides. So you'll actually see my dog. This is not my dog. But so dogs need it, horses need it, everyone needs it. So it's it's a universal need, which means that just like hunger uh, or thirst uh, or any other really of these basic needs, those fundamental needs that Maslow put on the in the very foundation of his hierarchy, you cannot get rid of it. You can be proactive about it. You can find different ways to achieve that, to achieve, to satisfy your need. But there is uh, simply no way for you to get rid of the need to self-soothe. This doesn't say anything about you. It doesn't make you weak. Uh, it doesn't make you broken. Uh, it doesn't make you deficient in any way. It is perfectly normal and perfectly natural. The only problem with body-focused repetitive behaviors that I see is that it is a harmful way of self-soothing. So you're self-soothing, but you're also creating damage and kind of more agitation that you will have to soothe in an equally dysfunctional way later on. So 
that that's about it. That's the the summary. Uh, before you, uh, also maybe if I if I would give you an assignment here, uh, I would get you to really just think about how you relate to the idea that you need soothing, and see if you can identify any points of judgment, like the clients that I quoted. They all have a degree of judgment there, uh, denial, pushing away, lack of acceptance. Because all of these will affect your practical attempts uh, to self-soothe and might might lead you to give up uh, or uh, just continue to maintain unhealthy ways of self-soothing. Because uh, if your motivation is not there, if the intention is not there, then even the most efficient techniques are not going to be good enough in the long run. But what is this self-soothing that we are now discussing? So the simplest way to think about self-soothing as the most primitive, in, in a sense, the oldest way of emotional self-regulation that we have. I've underlined the word old here, and I will come back to this. If you remember one of my uh, one of the quotes, the first one, um, let me go back uh, and show it to you here. Uh, here. Uh, the client starts with this. He says, isn't that something that babies do? I shouldn't need that much of it. When I say old, that is what I mean. It's it's old in, 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 in the sense that even babies need it. So it goes back, it goes all the way back to the earliest um, periods of our lives. But it's also old in the sense that it, it goes, it's not limited to just our species. It's, it's kind of present in others as well. So evolutionarily, it's also very old because self-regulation is something without which we cannot really survive or function. So because it's so old, it's not really tied. All our old mechanisms, so all our childish uh, or infantile, maybe that's a better way of putting it without making it sound judgy, all our infantile behaviors don't tend to be very subtle. So in self-soothing isn't very subtle either. It, it's not tied to a specific emotion. In fact, you don't even need to know how to differentiate your emotions. You will still need self-soothing and can still soothe yourself efficiently. So self-soothing doesn't involve any psychological processing whatsoever. Uh, I will explain why it doesn't. And also, I have to uh, I have to add this here: the fact that it doesn't involve psychological processing of emotions doesn't mean that you shouldn't actually learn how to do that. That is a, a very important skill for your well-being. Uh, it just so happens to be unnecessary for self-soothing, right? And when I say psychological processing, I mean differentiating between your emotions. I mean putting a verbal label on the emotion and understanding what is it that the emotion is, quote unquote, telling you, and then changing and adjusting accordingly. None of this is, is what we do with self-soothing. Right. Uh, there, there is, uh, I wouldn't say a lot of research on self-soothing, but there is a healthy amount of research out there. And some of the studies, they usually, uh, I will explain how what these studies usually uh, use as a way of self-soothing, but they test certain physiological parameters and then see how they change when we're agitated versus after we self-soothe or after someone soothes us. So here are some findings from these studies. Uh, we know that self-soothing lowers blood pressure. Uh, we know that it lowers your heart rate. Then it decreases anxiety. So you can kind of see from lowering heart rate indirectly is related to decrease to decreased anxiety, but anxiety is not obviously just limited to your heart rate. It also has to do with uh, you know your body sensations. It has to do with uh, how with your breathing patterns, with um, sweating. Um, with how you think or how fast you think. Um, so there, anxiety is a very complex phenomenon. So overall, when you administer a questionnaire, uh, self-soothing will decrease anxiety levels. It also decreases stress levels. This is quite important. And we know this to be the case 
because we can also measure cortisol levels. So we don't have to rely only on subjective mm -hmm. reports. We can measure cortisol. Uh, and uh, we, um, we know that that when when you're under a lot of stress, this is physiology one on one, uh, your cortisol levels go up. So it's it's people call it the stress hormone because it you have more of it in your blood when you're under stress. And then cortisol starts a whole series of biochemical processes in your body that are supposed to allow you to go through this stressful period. Uh, as efficiently as possible. So one of the things that cortisol does, for example, is elevate your elevates your blood sugar, uh, well, levels of glucose in your in, in your blood. And this is really very useful in stressful situations because your muscles and your brain have um, have the fuel that they need at their disposal right away. when 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 cortisol is elevated for longer periods of time, this can cause quite a bit of um, problems for you physically. And just think, having elevated glucose for longer periods of time can cause really serious side effects. So we know that self-soothing will also lower your cortisol levels. So we have a um, almost a biological marker of, of its anti-stress effect. And then overall, we see uh, an increase in vagal activity. This put in, in, in different terms, means that we see a decrease in sympathetic activity. So when, when parasympathetic system is, is more active, then the sympathetic system is less active. So overall, that means there's less agitation. Your, your, your body is less excited in, in that sense. So these are the biological effects of self-soothing. And these are actually the effects that we are after. That's what we're looking for. We're not looking for a psychological effect. Any, any psychological effect is a consequence of what I just listed here, or mainly of what I just listed here. Self-soothing serves just one purpose, really, which is to return your body to a state of homeostasis, equilibrium, to restore balance. That's what it's supposed to do. Uh, it's a way to alleviate the agitation in your body. Self-soothing is not about positive or negative emotions, but about their effects on the body and their intensity. Sometimes you can be very happy and very excited about something, something good, something positive in your life, and still need to self-soothe. In fact, I don't. This is not the most common thing I see, but it's not rare by any means. Um, so uh, people will sometimes pick or pull uh, when they hear good news or when they're very pleasantly surprised by something suddenly because our bodies react. Uh, what we cannot tolerate is what happens in our bodies when we feel something. That's usually the issue. Uh, and if you think about it, for example, anxiety and even happiness can feel the same way. Both will have, both will involve elevated heart rate. Uh, both will involve uh, an activation of your sympathetic nervous system because you're excited, you're looking forward to something. So on the level of our bodies, a lot of these emotions will feel not the same, but they will feel similar. And so self-soothing is meant to remove all these sensations regardless of the context. In fact, um, because this is so old, uh, we can't even talk for self-soothing. We can't even, I think, uh, even theoretically, we cannot say that it has to do with positive or negative emotions because uh, babies don't have this distinction. A baby do really doesn't know what positive means or negative. Uh, this is something that we acquire as we grow up through culture and language and uh, our environment, our families, friends, guardians, you know, whoever. Uh, this picture on the left, this is uh, this is a beach near my house, and it's one of the it's, it's a really pretty beach. This is in the morning. Um, I took this picture a couple of days ago, like maybe a week ago. Um, and the good thing about it is that it somehow um, flies under the radar and outside of few locals, there are no tourists there. 
So it's a very soothing place. And when I was thinking about self-soothing, I kept thinking about different beaches around the world that I've been to, that I've been in, because this is usually my idea of self-soothing. Uh, think of this as a preview of a technique that I will show you later on. So we have to talk about babies now. Uh, the reason why we have to talk about babies is because I call this an infantile need. And I didn't mean that in any judgy way, just, just, just kind of to indicate that it is a need that we have since we, we are born. Uh, however, when we are born, we're not really able to self-soothe. A baby is at the mercy of its parents. And it's the parent's job to soothe the baby. In fact, our the parent's responsibilities don't stop there. Uh, later on, it's their job how to teach the baby to self-soothe in a healthy way. And as the baby grows to be a child and, you know, later on uh, grows further, it's the parent's job to give the baby or to give their child um, healthy ways of processing and understanding their emotions. Very frequently, parents don't do that, not out of malice, uh, but because they also don't have these skills. They can't teach you a skill that they don't have, right? So sometimes it happens that people will grow up and will remain completely incapable of differentiating their emotions. They will know all the right words, uh, but they will have a hard time uh, telling their own feelings apart. Uh, so I, I was saying, I, I'm... My my proneness to digressions is only worsening. So when baby when a baby is born, it depends on the parents for self soothing, and then around the age of six months, you can start teaching a baby how to how to self soothe, and the baby also shows some signs of self soothing. So baby has its own ways of self soothing. Uh, I will tell you about these uh, simply because some of them are uh, some of them might be relatable to you, and some of them you can adapt even as an adult into a self-soothing technique. So the the key here, the absolute key here, is that self-soothing is something that we begin to learn before we learn how to speak. So it's something that happens before the acquisition of language, and because of this, it has nothing to do with with emotional processing, because before language, before we become embedded into a culture, before we adopt a language, we can't really talk about emotions as such. Because we don't have the, since we don't, we're not, we don't have the words and we don't have the concepts. Uh, how we divide the spectrum of reactions that we can have uh, in relation to whatever is happening to us, uh, is not as universal as we'd like to think. Uh, different cultures uh, and different um, and, and different families even will have different ways of treating certain emotional uh, emotional experiences, and then we will give them different words. We will classify them differently. Uh, the idea that there are positive and negative emotions is not something that biology tells us at all. Uh, this is something that arose from our cultural understanding because we think it's good to be happy but it's not good to be sad and then when we feel sadness we say well this is a negative emotion um, but before we learn these cultural distinctions uh, this baby here for example on the picture has no clue what's positive what's negative it just knows i'm either calm or i'm aroused and that's pretty much it right so this is why I'm un underlining the word old. That means that when you want to find a way of self-soothing, uh, words are secondary, even useless in some situations. Like imagine this baby right here, instead of sleeping, imagine the baby screaming. Do you think it would be useful for you to explain to the baby that screaming is not the most elegant way of communicating something and ask the baby to tell you what's wrong with it? Of course not. Uh, if that baby could do that, it would probably be an alien baby, right? So essentially, as a parent, you have to guess what the baby needs because the baby has no idea. The baby actually learns how to differentiate its needs through your interaction with it. So the baby will cry, you will breastfeed the baby. 
uh, sometimes that will be that will work. Sometimes it won't work. And it's based on this that that both you and the baby learn how to um, how to how to how to regulate and what certain certain sensations mean and how to symbolize them and how to communicate them. Uh, so when when people tell me I try to talk myself out of picking or I try to tell myself to stop pulling. Or even worse, when they tell me I will use affirmations uh, to soothe myself, I first try not to roll my eyes and then tell them that it's probably not going to work. Um, you can't verbally convince yourself, uh, or at least a part of yourself, that it's so old that it doesn't speak English or any language whatsoever. Uh, I usually ask my clients when they tell me about these verbal maneuvers that I try to do, I usually ask them, um, can you tell me, um, can you tell me how you do that, how you talk to yourself? Because in these situations, uh, the tone of voice is more important than the actual words. Like you can recite the phone book to a baby and still produce the effect of soothing as long as you recite it in a kind, gentle way. So even if you employ self-talk, think about the tone more than the content. So how do we recognize that a baby is self-soothing? We see babies' heads shaking. This is something weirdly that my dog also does. Uh, thumping its legs against a mattress or a wall this is, for example, this is a ba this is an infantile equivalent of grounding exercises. Um, if you're, um, uh, yeah, I don't think I, we, uh, I don't think we have any material just yet on grounding exercises. I will make sure to provide some in the coming weeks. But one of the ways for you to to ground yourself and provide some self soothing is to stomp your feet on the ground or just press your feet against the ground very firmly. And then focus on, on that feeling, because that gives you a feeling of stability and even safety. Uh, so that would be one, one component. Uh, playing with hands is another way for a baby to self-soothe. Thumb sucking. Um, I've had numerous clients over the years who would tell me that uh, they would, um, that they would, for example, uh, suck their thumb even, you know, up until the age of when they start school or even afterwards, and then uh, they would replace that with picking or pulling. So that's just an extension of a self-soothing technique. Rocking back and forth is also very soothing. Pay attention how some of these things are repetitive. Thumb sucking involves repetition, head shaking involves repetition, thumping legs against a mattress or a wall involves repetition, and so on. Crying is also a way for a baby to self-soothe, but also for an adult. Uh, so let's take a look at the other side now, which is how do parents soothe their, uh, their baby? One thing is routine. Babies respond really well to, ha to having predefined times when they go to sleep. Adults as well react well to routine. So if you create and this because it gives them a self, sense of safety. So we have the repetition and we have a sense of safety already as some aspects of, of self-soothing. Um, so routine give, makes us feel safe. This is the same for children and for adults. Uh, introducing routine into your life, not a restrictive, oppressive routine, just some general structure can be very, very beneficial. And in fact, can reduce the need to self-soothe acutely because you will take care of that need to a large degree by introducing a routine. Low stimulation environment is also something that is very important for babies and also for adults. I will give you a personal example here. It's not related to BFRBs, but it shows how sometimes we're not even aware of the stimuli that actually matter to us. I wouldn't call myself an anxious person really by any stretch of imagination. Um, I've been meditating for over a decade. My heart rate is rarely affected by what happens around me to the point that some of my friends think it's a bit worrying. Uh, of course, I do feel anxiety sometimes. It's just that it's not the most common thing that I feel. 
And I do struggle uh, from ringing in my ears, tinnitus. And I was reading online because there's really no medical way of treating this, at least as of now. Um, and I was looking for different ways, you know, whatever helps people on, on online forums and Reddit and places like that. And I found this company that makes these, they're not earplugs. I don't even know what's, how to call them. Like uh, they have a hole inside. Uh, it's like these little tubes that you can put into your ears and they're almost invisible. So you can walk around and no one will see anything. And it's made of silicone. And then what happens is that it uh, it absorbs uh, and the, the the noise from your environment, and the the shape of the canal inside is made in such a way that it focuses the sounds that come from the external from your environment. Right. Uh, so I tried, and some people said that it it helped them accidentally reduce their tinnitus or or get rid of it altogether. And I thought, well, this is really cheap. Let me just give it a try. I ordered a pair. I remember very well the first time I tried them because the the postman had interrupted my session and I had to go downstairs to sign for the for the package and I was back in my office and after my session I put this I, I put this thing um they're called flares flare audio is the company that makes them so I put these in my in my ears and I was writing my notes from the session and suddenly I felt something so unusual which is that i felt like after maybe 10 minutes or so how i felt suddenly relaxed like there was a layer of tension that i was completely unaware of that just disappeared and it it appears that you know when this device this thing uh when it absorbed some of the environmental noise my whole body relaxed a little more my mind was still before and it was still after, but it appears that this environmental noise was keeping me, let's say, on edge, but in such a subtle way that I was I didn't I couldn't even notice it. And aside from this, uh, this is this is this talks about noise right, that comes from the outside, but aside from this, we're stimulated in in nearly every imaginable way. Um, if you're actually sitting and listening to this and watching this and not doing anything else, like checking your messages or uh, cleaning something or reading something in seven different tabs in your browser, I would be truly shocked. Like for work and in our private lives, we are constantly bombarded by stimulation. Some people might be more susceptible to this, others less so. But providing a low stimulation environment for yourself is likely going to be quite helpful. So we're talking here about ways to self-soothe without having, um, so you're modifying your lifestyle, you're modifying where you live, where you work, and so on. It's not necessarily a technique, but it does help you self-soothe. Rocking, so a parent will pick up, pick the baby up and then rock them gently. Again, a repetitive, form of repetitive behavior. Hushing or playing white noise. Or for, for adults, for example, nature sounds. I find these incredibly soothing. And frequently when I'm writing the blogs or uh, just writing reports, uh, this is something that I will be doing. I will be playing nature sounds. Uh, you can also experiment with, with different types of music. Swaddling is a way to soothe the baby and touch. Babies react to touch um, and even adults react to touch. And a lot of research that I come across that talks about self-soothing is related to touch because it's very easy to find someone to hold your hand or give you a hug. Uh, so this is a very important and well-tested empirically. So we know from research and and most of us know from experience that a hug from the right person, you know, in the right moment can be very, very soothing. All of these, as you can see, uh, are applicable for adults as well. So the the lady on the right is my dog, Sarah. And she here, she was in a dire need of self-soothing because <laughs> I was eating cheesecake and I wouldn't give her any. And she was staring at me like this, thinking... 
Why are you torturing me? Why are you do why don't you love me anymore? What is happening here? Oh, she's adorable. But this is her confused slash sad slash I'm begging you give it to me uh look. It can actually get even more intense than this. Uh, uh, but I always mention my dog and I thought I'll show you my dog once. So here she is. It's not because she's mine, but she's the most beautiful Cocker Spaniel ever. Um, anyway, so what if parents don't know how to teach their baby to, to self-soothe? And what if parents don't know how to soothe their baby? So these are important questions. Um, first of all, because how parents treat our emotions is how we learn to treat our own emotions, right? Our school systems, and I can say, no matter where you're from, because in the club, we have clients from all over the world. Um, it doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, it's very likely that you do not learn how to treat yourself compassionately or how to meditate in school. Instead, you learn, you know, I don't know, geography and math and stuff like this. I almost wish that they would put some kind of emotional education or teach mindfulness in schools from early age. I think schools would be much happier environments as a result. But the point is, is that the way things are now, and especially the way things were in the past, uh, you only had your parents or your guardians to teach you this. So there, there are three points here that I would like to, to discuss. One is in your earliest period, in those first six months, do your parents know how to soothe you? Or did they know, rather, before you were able to self-soothe and before you were able to learn how to self-soothe? So what happens if they're not able to calm, the, calm their baby down? Uh, the baby's body is constantly agitated. It's always upset in some way, right? Uh, this is not... The, I don't want to draw a parallel with trauma because I don't think parents intentionally traumatize their children. That's not at all what I mean. Parents usually do their best. And, you know, sometimes their best is not good enough, but it's, but they're, they're not, they're not, not good enough for lack of trying. Most parents do their best, but when they don't know how to do something, they can't really teach it to anyone else. Right. So, uh, but consider trauma because this is something I think that's more, it's, it's more relatable than talking about how a newborn feels. But when you're, when you experience a trauma, uh, one of the effects that trauma has on, on the body and the mind is that it keeps you vigilant all the time. So your body is never fully calm and fully relaxed because it's always anticipating danger. I've, I, in the past, I've worked with uh, war veterans and uh, victims of domestic abuse and clients who have been seriously traumatized in, in most unimaginable ways. Um, and it would very frequently happen, and it happens in my practice, actually happened last week in my practice, uh, that like when you hear a sudden sound somewhere, the client will just jump up almost like there's something bad happening in the in the therapy room. And this happens because their bodies are constantly on the lookout for stress because they have been stressed so much that being calm and feeling safe feels unimaginable. And something similar, although not the same, happens to a baby that cannot that parents don't know how to soothe. The baby stays agitated. And this agitation then remains with the baby as it grows up. And this shapes uh, and determines how much self-soothing it will need later on in life. This doesn't mean that everyone uh, whose parents didn't know how to soothe them will, will struggle with this, but there is a likelihood. And it also doesn't mean that you can never change this. It's just because it's been present for so long you, it might take that much more work. Um, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is how your parents teach you to self-soothe and if they're able to teach you how to do that properly. For example, uh, my parents didn't know what breathing exercises were, but they did teach me to take deep breaths when I'm upset when I was when I was young. They just knew from their own experience that this works. 
So when when in therapy or coaching or whatever, some form of self-help, uh, you encounter breathing exercises, people think of this as, as some weird skill that is being taught to people who have issues. But this is something that a lot of people know how to do because they, they learned it from their parents. It comes naturally to them. It doesn't feel like a technique. It just feels like a spontaneous response. And then there is this, um, as the as the baby, you know, grows and develops, uh, and as baby's cognitive apparatus starts to develop, it will pay attention to how 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 its parents uh, treat their own emotions, uh, meaning individually and each other, and how they treat the child as well. And the child will internalize these patterns. So sometimes when you get a message, get a message like, um, oh, just stop crying or, you know, don't be a baby, uh, you will grow up and then say what my client said uh, isn't self-soothing something babies do. You know, why the hell should I need this in my life? You know, I'm not a baby. Uh, if you get if, if, if the message that you internalize from your parents is that in order to be, I don't know, a good person, you have to suck it up and and just push your emotions down, then you won't know, you, you will be so unaware of your emotions that you will not even know that you need soothing, nonetheless, how to process those emotions and what they are. So these early interactions that, that the parent and the child have are really, really important. None of this is forever. All of this can be changed. We're not saying this to blame the parents. I just have to underline these things. So there's no place for fatalism. And if you perhaps feel anger towards your parents, that's a perfectly fine feeling to have. Uh, but then it merits its own exploration. You don't have to call your parents and yell at them. Because if they knew better, they would have done better. Uh, now I want to explain something else uh, that that is closely related to, to this idea that... Um, that soothing is something that shouldn't be done necessarily with words. Uh, and this is the idea that our experience is layered. Uh, the guy on the photo here is, as if, you've, if you know me, then you know George Kelly. Uh, he's the father of personal construct psychology and my favorite psychologists of all times. And so he was, uh, since his psychology is called personal construct psychology, obviously constraining uh, is or creating anticipations, maybe that's a better way, giving meaning to the world. It might be better ways of, less technical ways of, of phrasing it, uh, is a fundamental psychological process. Assigning meaning to things, noticing patterns, and then creating predictions based on these is something that, um, uh, that for Kelly is the fundamental activity of our psyche. Like that's the basic unit of, of how we process the world. And that's something that we do since birth, meaning that is something that we do even before we learn how to speak. So some processes of construing are related to words, but aren't, others aren't. When we learn how to speak, most of our construing is verbal. So it's mediated by words. And the reason for that is because we live in a world that privileges words over other, other ways of symbolizing reality. Because words have agreed upon meaning most of the time, and then they're easy to communicate. So it's not difficult to understand why we privilege words. But that doesn't mean that these other layers of construing actually stop, because they don't. So we can talk about at least three different layers of experience. One is called verbal which is when you can exactly tell me what is happening by using words, precise words, then we can call something nonverbal, and or maybe a better way to, to call this is tacit. So it doesn't involve words and it's not necessarily even conscious, but if I ask you about it with some thinking and maybe creative use of words, you are able to convey your experience to me. And then there are processes that are called preverbal, which are very, very, very old. So those baby processes, baby constructs. 
and they're called pre-verbal because they're so old that they cannot uh, they cannot really be communicated with words. And this is the level at which self-soothing operates. All these layers of experience uh, operate within us all the time. You know how some self-help psychologists talk about the inner child? Uh, sometimes I don't really like everything that is said around that concept. But here, if we take that metaphor, here we would say that we not only have an inner child, we also have an inner infant. And that infant needs to be treated as such. Uh, you don't need to go into, uh, we don't need to go into depths of Kelly's theory, even though God knows I would really like to right now. Just understand that you are not only your conscious mind and understand that there are several layers of processing the world that you employ in every given moment. Some you're more aware of and some others you're less aware of. Uh, for Kelly, essentially, the difference between things that are conscious and things that are not conscious is how communicable are they with words. So our pre-verbal constructs operate as we speak right now. They just go unnoticed because they might manifest themselves as a vague body sensation or as some kind of strange gut feeling, like an intuition of some sorts. We might smell danger sometimes. You know, there, there are all these different ways that are very, very difficult to explain with words. And so when self-soothing arises, this is the level of experience at which it arises. And if you want to communicate with that part of yourself, then you have to use symbols that it understands, which is why I was talking so much about babies. So... Here are some forms of self-soothing. I will not go through all of these with you. Uh, you can use the suggestion box and then tell me if you'd like a webinar on any of these specifically, and I will prepare one for you. Um, breathing exercises are very efficient and, and very good ways to self-soothe in three or four minutes. If you are in the uh, if you are in the VIP lounge, you can go to your download section, and we have a small booklet with breathing exercises you can download. Uh, grounding exercises are not available as of yet, but when I started recording this webinar, I realized that we should probably create a download um, for that as well. I have the materials, and I will make sure that our team creates a PDF booklet and makes it available for you. You can use visualization exercises, and I will show you practical examples of what I do for myself. You can use sensory stimulation. We'll talk about that a little more. Movement, dance, pressure, and warmth. And we will also address these in the, in the following slides. But breathing and grounding exercises are just too uh, big of a topic to be included in one or two slides, right? So that's why you have the you have one booklet to download. You'll have the other when you in, in the VIP lounge. And um, there's also, I can make a webinar on these as well. Uh, so I'm going to talk about those facets that I mentioned. So one of them, or aspects, one of them is skin. Uh, and as I said, research around self-soothing focuses on the skin mainly, uh, specifically skin to skin contact. So not if your skin is perfect or smooth, none of this just skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, it's very effective if it's coming from a person that we feel safe with. In that case, any form of touching is soothing. They can touch your shoulder, hold your hand, hug you. All of it has a very soothing effect. And the, the, the closer you are to that person, now I don't mean physically, I mean emotionally and psychologically, uh, the more effective the, the soothing effect or the larger the effect is. So uh, your friend might be less soothing to you than your partner or your parent. That's what I meant. Uh, we usually have these um, like degrees of closeness. And so uh, more intimate we are with someone, their touch is more soothing to us. Um, our own skin can be soothing as well. So we can technically self-soothe by using touch. Uh, if you go, this is available. So uh, if you're in the VIP lounge, you can actually download the whole file. 
the meditation that uses, well, meditation slash self-soothing exercise that uses touch. You can download it. And if you and everyone else can play it in, if you go to the blogs, there is one blog. Um, it's titled like something like self-soothing exercise and you can play it and learn how to use it. It's rather simple to learn. But some of the places on, on most people's bodies that, that, that feel soothing are chest, abdomen, uh, or just giving yourself hugs, just kind of wrapping your own arms around you. Uh, the way this works is that you put your hand on your chest or on your abdomen or both at the same time, but you put it under your shirt and then close your eyes and then focus. I'm doing it right now, so that's why I'm I'm slowing down. Um, and then you focus on the warmth because when skin touches skin, there's this warm sensation that is being created. And the more you focus on the warmth, the stronger it becomes and it starts spreading all over your body and it produces this really wonderful soothing effect. If you have someone that is going through this process with you, they can hug you or hold your hand it's a good way, holding your hand is a good way to prevent you from picking or pulling. But at the same time, the touch will provide a soothing sensation. You know, you can have a hug buddy, someone that will that will help you when you need it. So this is skin to skin contact. This is quite an important one. Uh, I don't know if I've made a slide about pressure specifically, but I can maybe mention that here and then I'll skip it when I get there because I, my, I'm blanking out right now on the rest of the presentation. Um, sometimes pressure works very well. There are very heavy blankets that people can cover themselves with and they have a soothing effect. Sometimes placing a pillow on your abdomen and hugging it can be very soothing as well. Uh, there are even pillows that are sold, and I've had some clients who use these. Um, these pillows are kind of shaped like a human being, like a silhouette, and then you can hug it and sleep with it. This is also very soothing. Uh, also, try to investigate your body outside of these areas that I mentioned. Chest and abdomen are just the most common areas that feel soothing, but because everyone else has their own lived experience, everyone has a different response to different parts of their bodies. In some places, touch might not be soothing to you. In fact, it might be upsetting. Uh, I had a client who, uh, who, who found a place like um, on the back of his shoulder, uh, like touching his shoulder blade. Like for example, when I, when I put my, my hand there, I feel some warmth, but nowhere nearly as intensely as when I do on my chest. But for my client, that part was more uh, was more effective than chest or abdomen. And it was difficult for him to figure out why. So we talked about it. And um, he recalled during one of our sessions that when his father was still alive, uh, whenever he would stand next to him, his father would put his hand on on his on the back of his shoulder and that would make my client feel very safe and so this area then remained sensitive in a way i find this very fascinating and um if i could possibly you know have my own lab to finance research to my liking this would certainly be one area because this is a wonderful example of how biology and psychology overlap and influence each other so there's nothing about nerve endings there that that say this is soothing or this is not soothing uh, it's the meaning that counts putting your hand on your chest is not soothing because there is some magical organ well there's the heart but the heart is important for self-soothing because of what we culturally think of as the heart when you put put your hand on your chest it's just skin to skin contact it's the meaning that it has for us that makes it so soothing so we are in a sense conditioned by our culture to be to be calm when certain when certain stimuli are are included and this is a biological mechanism at the same time so it's this wonderful 
overlap that shows how both have tremendous importance and how one really cannot work without the other, which is why I guess being reductionist when it comes to psychology is never is never a good thing. And one of the reasons why I like constructivism so much is because it is a very holistic way of looking at people. So it doesn't exclude any perspective by default. It just asks us to consider what's the most useful perspective for a, for a specific situation. Feeling safe is another aspect of this, uh, of self-soothing. Um, and we can divide this into two categories, inner and outer sense of safety. So you can be in a safe environment. Sometimes uh, when people are upset, uh, especially like younger people and adolescents, they will go to their room and close the door. Sometimes it feels good to just go under the blanket in your bed and, I don't know, play some music or a TV show. When you do this, you're actually creating a safe environment for yourself. If you're picking or pulling while you're doing it, then you're not quite succeeding. But for some people, this can be very comforting. For example, for me... Um, Drinking tea and reading a book in my living room creates a very safe environment. And if I've had a very long day or a very difficult day, or if I get upsetting news, I'm probably going to make some tea, uh, pick up a book, and it's going to book to be one of those books that I've read over and over again, so that I that everything is predictable but enjoyable, and that will be very self-soothing to me. Uh, presence of certain people can be very soothing or absence of people as well. And this, as you can imagine, heavily depends on your other needs and also your lived experience. Pets are soothing. Uh, we know from studies that the way, uh, so when a parent bonds to a child, what happens in, in our brains, and this has been researched, is that there's an increase in oxytocin secretion. So oxytocin is a bit of a mysterious uh, peptide or hormone. Um, and one of the functions that we know that it does is that it actually promotes bonding between the parent and the child. And it does the same for pets. So when you play with your dog or your cat or whatever pet you have, uh, this I know that this research is, has been done on dogs, so I can guarantee for dogs that both the dog and the owner have increased oxytocin secretion. And playing with the animal makes us feel safer. God, you see, this is how... how, how Pet owners are nuts. I just said animal, and I thought, why are you calling Sarah an animal? I mean, she is one and I am one, but it just sounds so harsh. Because we bond to them the way we would bond to a child. And playing with them is also incredibly soothing. Biologically also, not just not just psychologically. I already mentioned a blanket or, or some specific clothing. Uh, the more clothes you put on yourself, the safer you will feel. And pressure sometimes imitates, you know, like um, when, a, when a parent holds their baby, there's a bit of pressure that's created that makes the baby feel safe. And then having a blanket, a very heavy blanket or layers of clothing provides something similar for adults. Uh, you can do grounding exercises to feel safer. Uh, as I said, I will create a PDF for the... Um, for the VIP members, and um, I can do a webinar if you want. The, there's a suggestion box that's available to everyone. When you log in uh, on the main page, you will see it. So just, it's anonymous, so just type what you like and submit. And then I'll talk a little bit about memories now and how they can uh, soothe you. So uh, what is this about? So you can create a self-soothing uh, meditation by using visualization. Uh, the principle is really very simple. Uh, you do it in two steps. First, you calm down, sit, relax, pay attention to your breath a little bit, or do a quick body scan, you know, something along those lines, or just do a grounding exercise or a breathing exercise so that your mind is more stable and clearer. And then go back in your memory to a safe place. I have four places here, although I wanted to include the fifth one as well, but I couldn't create a good layout for the slide. The fifth place is this garden in Budapest where I like to go. Um, it's real, it's in the center, but somehow it got protected from tourists. 
And when I used to live there, I would go there every Saturday morning and um, have coffee and read a book and sit there for hours. And I will not say what garden it is because I don't want to promote tourism there. But it's a public park, a small one protected uh, by, it's kind of, it, it, it's just, it, it, it's really very close to the center, but it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't, you, there's not even any noise there. Um, so that's one place where I go. The sunset that you see here on the right, uh, this is the, the same beach that I showed you before, just at a different time of day. The picture under this one is the Valley of the Temples, close to Agrigento, which is quite close to, to my house in Italy. Uh, and this is um, outside of Greece. This is the largest and best preserved, actually outside of the Acropolis itself in, in Athens. The, the best preserved Greek temples are here. And it's a remarkable place. It's on this plateau, and then you can see the sea in the distance. And the sunset, uh, when the sun rays tr start kind of penetrating between these columns, it's just visually sublime. And it's one of my favorite places in the world. Um, and I love going there. And especially when there are not too many tourists, because it, it's not very soothing when they scream and yell. But this is one of my places. Uh, the top left image is uh, the Malecon in Havana. So somewhere out there in the distance, is Florida. Havana in general is a city that I like to go back to physically and that I go back to in my mind very frequently. This is not the only place. This is just one place because when I was making the presentation, apparently uh, the, the water was a thing for me. But there are many places in Havana where, where I go to mentally and I find that incredibly soothing because those are places where in real life I feel very safe and I feel at home. I'm not from Havana, but for whatever strange reason, I feel like I'm at home there and I feel perfectly safe. For example, um, one of the places that I go to is uh, is um, the University of Havana because it has this spectacular uh, columns and then this little park where you can sit. It's just remarkable. And some other places that I'm going to keep to myself. So Malecon is really beautiful because and very good for this type of visualization. Uh, because there's a lot of empty space and the whole sense of safety comes from the atmosphere. And then this here lower is San Giovanni in Laterano. This is a picture that I actually took a couple of weeks ago. This is in Rome. Um, Rome is, of, of course, full of magnificent buildings, but there's just something about the interior of this particular uh, um, basilica that I find just, I don't know, so regal and you feel really very protected by the tall ceilings and these massive statues that are inside and beautiful lighting and it's it's really spectacular. So what I do, uh, let's take the, the, the Havana image here. Uh, what I do is, so I will do a breathing exercise or grounding or something to center myself. And then I will visualize that I'm there on the Malecon. Preferably this man goes away in my visualization exercise. This is the photo that I took and it's, it's a piece of it. And I quite like the photo, that's why I used used it. But normally when I visualize it, people are not there because those parts of the Malecon that I like are slightly outside of the center of Havana so that you don't have many tourists there. I sit there usually, just watch the sunset um, and relax. Sometimes I read or journal. Uh, but what I imagine is, or, or rather what I recall is the visual. So the sea, the waves, the colors of the sky. Uh, if you sit there and then look on your right, you're going to see uh, like Havana, those rows of colonial architecture. Uh, that's what I imagine. I remember the smells because to me, Havana has a very particular smell. Uh, and I can like, if you, if you blindfold me and take me there, I will just by smelling it, I will know where I am. And then I'm close to the sea, to the ocean. So the ocean will also have its own smell. Uh, I, can, I recall this, the, the heat because this concrete of the Malecon in the, uh, becomes very warm during the day. And then I, you can feel the heat if you lie there or, or just sit there. I, I recall that sense of, of being warm. 
So what I recall, if you're following me, is the tactile sensations. It's the sounds, it's the smells, um, it's the visuals. So the sensory information. This is almost like a grounding exercise that you do in your mind. Because when you anchor yourself in, in the sensory data, that is when you get the soothing effect. And the same applies to all of these. I don't care that this is a Catholic basilica. I, I, I'm not Catholic. I'm not, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't matter to me whatsoever. It's the light inside. It's the, the proportions of the building. Uh, it's even the smell of it sometimes. So it's the it's the sensory information, the sensory input that um, that really feels soothing. So when you do a visualization, that is what you bring back. You don't need to replay a scene. You need the landscape, and you need the 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 information that you can extract from your memories about what it was like to be there. Uh, Okay, so enough about that. Uh, let me uh, give you a few more uh, tips. So there's repetition and emotional expression. Uh, when I say emotional expression, again, I don't mean that you need to know how to differentiate the emotions. Uh, repetitive movements, I think you, you got this by now, are very soothing. So just rocking back and forth, for example, is very useful. The chair that I'm sitting on, which you cannot see, just an office chair that you can adjust in different ways. Uh, because I'm sitting in it for so long, it's kind of disheveled by now and it's moving in all sorts of directions. And I've noticed that sometimes I will move myself, move the chair on purpose. And it's it's not a big amplitude, it's just like very gentle movements left and right. But when I repeat them and I focus on them, I find them very soothing. Uh, here you can also there's another uh, there's another example here which is very different, um, and this is mantra meditations. So I don't mean repeating phrases uh, to cultivate I don't know loving kindness or equanimity. You know how when you when you if you want to um, when you want to cultivate loving kindness you will repeat a phrase like may I be well may I be happy, um, and with that kind of repetition, the goal is to reflect on the phrase, see how it makes you feel, let it linger in your awareness. So there is a, a kind of contemplative aspect. But with mantra repetition, you don't have that. Mantras frequently don't actually mean anything. Uh, so, But mantras are repetitive. And there have been some studies that show that mantras have an effect, you know, they help you concentrate, but they also have a soothing effect due to the fact that they're so repetitive. Apparently, it doesn't really matter what you repeat. So this is completely irrelevant. Um, there is actually one study from, I think from Tel Aviv University, but I'm not sure. It's, it's, an, it's not a new study. It's been done like 10 years ago or even more. Um, and in this study, uh, they were having people repeat uh, just meaningless things like counting to 10 and doing that over and over and over again. Uh, and it turns out that when you meditate on counting, so just repeat that as a mantra, uh, that this has a very soothing effect. Uh, this is why some some kinds of music can also be very soothing. Um, I like, uh, so you all, I guess if you know me, then you know that, that I like classical music quite a bit. And a good deal of 20th century classical music can, can be really useful for this. Um, I mean things like Philip Glass or other minimalists. Uh, Glass has an opera that I used to love when I was younger, and I didn't know why. I thought it was the most amazing thing, but it was just really very soothing. And now I understand that in hindsight. Uh, the opera is called Einstein on the Beach. And there is a choir in that opera that sings... One two three four, one two three four, one two three four, and he repeats that all the time, uh, with some variation. And I thought that was the most magnificent thing in the world, and I could not explain to people why I like it so much because the res when I would play it to someone, the response I would get is, uh, "Dude, they're just saying one two three four. Like, what's your problem?" Uh, but what my problem was is that it was really very soothing. And I used to have it on my iPod, if you remember these, and just play it on repeat all the time. 
like drumming music, uh, like I mean, like shamanic drumming, for example, is also very repetitive. So it's also quite soothing. Movement of any kind, dancing is very soothing. Singing, you don't need to sing well, but sing. Whoops, sorry. Singing is uh, is very soothing. Uh, now it doesn't want to go back to the previous. Uh, ah, here it is. Um, yelling. So you usually only need like I don't know. 30 seconds to a minute of yelling, and this is very soothing, crying also, or expressing emotion in an exaggerated or, met or metaphorical way, as long as it involves the body, so not, not words. Um, so if you, you know, if you want to act like a baby, then act like an exaggerated baby. Sensory stimulation, we already talked about this. Um, so I, I will give you some tips and pointers here just really quickly because uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I've already been going on and on for, I think, over an hour at this point. Um, so tactile stimulation. You can use textiles, wood. Hand cream is quite good if you like, if if uh, a slippery feeling is soothing to you. Uh, rocks, like you can buy worry stones, but you don't have to. Even better is if you go to the beach. So this is not my picture. It's just a picture I found online. You can, if you take a look, each of these stones has a slightly different texture. Uh, so they can all, you can, I like to collect stones and I thought about photographing some of mine, but then I don't know, I didn't for whatever reason. Um, but what I like about stones is that even the, the smooth ones aren't smooth in the same way. Rough ones aren't rough in the same way. So there's a lot of variation. And what you can do is actually go out to a beach or you know wherever rocks can be found and then experiment with them. Close your eyes, touch them gently, see what happens. If it feels good, put it in a box and you can create like a small box of rocks and then use that as your self-soothing, I don't know, self-soothing box of rocks. Uh, the same goes for wood as well, like a lot of natural materials. And I advise you really to just go out into the nature and find them yourself. Because ordering something on Amazon is not the same thing. When you go out there and make an effort and try something and find something, you create a bond with that object. So you're more likely to, to use it. Sounds, we already talked about this. Um, ASMR also for some people, or the, although personally it freaks me out, but I know that it is very soothing to a lot of people. And then smells can be quite helpful. So perfumes, essential oils, um, incense, any of these can be quite soothing. The point is that there is no universal recipe. Uh, you have to experiment and try different things out. Perhaps what you need is a blanket and incense, for example, and maybe these two will soothe you. Uh, maybe you need to put your hand on your chest and smell lavender. Uh, maybe you need to, I don't know, watch TV and play with a worry stone, right? So you can create a different set of combinations. Uh, experiment, play around. Uh, don't think of this as wasting time. Think of it as you getting to know yourself getting to know your preferences, uh, be mindful uh, and, and just really be present when you're experimenting. Uh, the more you actually do it, the better. Uh, just the process of experimenting, you, even if you don't find anything revolutionarily new or useful, will be beneficial and soothing. And it's also a very compassionate thing to do because you're, you're, you're finding some time and setting some time aside to deal with your pre-verbal needs from the, for those infantile parts of yourself. And that's really beautiful. It's very useful if you develop some kind of mindfulness of the body, not necessarily through meditation, but just awareness of what's happening in your body, because that way you will be able to identify that you need soothing before it escalates into the urge to pick or to pull. Uh, you know, it's better to to treat it when it's two out of 10 in intensity than when it's 10 out of 10 and pulling or picking is the only way that you can soothe yourself. So mindfulness is your ally there. So that's it for, for this webinar. As I said, uh, keep your eye uh, on our on your inbox. I will send you notification when the surprise, um, surprise your, your new year present from us drops. 
Um, in the meantime, experiment, play around, and hopefully you'll find a good way to self-soothe. Um, if you're not a member of the club, but you're listening to this, go to the bfrbclub.com and join. You can either join the free tier or our VIP lounge. So uh, you're welcome to participate in our budding community. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me and um, see you around.